Julie and I talked a little bit about sort of what thoughts that we had about how to structure this time together. And I think the things that we wanted to sort of ascertain from our, our collaborators here is sort of get you thinking about what pregnancy related phenotypes would be of value to the larger community. I mean, we've been working on phenotypes a lot internally at Janssen, and I think, you know, we have some ideas about what we value, but I wondered if other people had input on that. Um, the other sort of topic that we were thinking about is um, what people's impediments were to getting the pregnancy and the linkage algorithms instantiated in their different um, data source networks across the Odyssey community. So if people are having specific problems or they're just not aware or just sort of how can we get you there um, is, is one large train of thought we were thinking. So um, so I feel like that kind of gets, gets us kicked off. I don't know if people want to hone in and start sort of giving us some thoughts on that or if people want to take a step back and just understand like what the algorithms are and, and whatnot. I invited a couple of our in-house experts um, Chris Knoll, uh, Jamie Weaver, especially Patrick, um, Claire as well. Um, we have, they have published on the uh, pregnancy algorithm and Jamie is working hard to get the publication on the linkage algorithm. So if there are specific um, technical questions, I thought, you know, they could probably address it or we could address it as a group. So Mui, I'll turn it over to you and see if you have anything to add. Now, as Jill's mentioned, right, we're really, um, when we asked to you know take this uh take this on we're like okay how can we structure the discussions and we really want to go uh, a systematic way of looking at it what are your use cases right why why is this mother uh, child linking important and what are the challenges that you're facing because in order to standardize we have to understand that first right before we can even talk about the solution let's stay, stay in the problem space we would love to stay in the problem space for this discussion and then maybe you know going further we can talk about the solution space so with that we'd like to open it up to the floor for folks to throw out you know what are their use cases and what are some of the challenges that you're having is it the algorithm is it the data what is it Everybody start screaming. <laughs> oh, Chris, we can't hear you. <laughs> As snarkily saying, we have no problems and implement the pregnancy algorithm perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming you're talking about the pregnancy algorithm from uh, the R package that um, Edgy might have put together. OK. Yeah, it looks like Pat Patrick has posed a question in the chat, too, if people haven't read it. it's. Who has built the pregnancy episodes or mother child linkages in their CDMs besides Jansen? Everybody has. Oh, well, we can't hear you either. It's a small crowd besides Jansen. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, Paul? <laughs> so, yeah, so I would love an overview of what the algorithm is. I haven't done the algorithm, we have not linked uh, mother child linkages in our CDM at Johns Hopkins yet. I guess it's worth clarifying that those are two different exercises, uh, yeah. the pregnancy, oh, pregnancy yes. episodes yes. and the yes. link. Yep. Absolutely. The the latter relies on the former to some extent. Okay. Okay. Anyone and, else and on the call want to chime in with directions they want to head on this call? Okay. All right, well, Paul, to address your question, there's a couple of places I would refer you to um, for more background information. Um, Jamie and I actually gave a talk on a pregnancy, I don't know, on an Odyssey call uh, back in um, 2017, I guess. Wow, Jamie, that was a while ago. Um, <laughs> it, it was 2018. I just erased all those dates from the slides that I might show you momentarily. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. But anyway, if you, uh, Paul, if you want to, I'm going to put the um, link to the uh, slides in the chat here, just as re reference. Um, I think it might be helpful. Um, Jamie, I have those slides pulled up, but I don't know if that's really the best, efficient, most interesting way to sort of proceed about having to, how you give the background on what's going on. Um, I'm happy to talk to the slides or just we can talk informally, whatever people prefer. Jamie, I'll defer to you since you're the expert in this place as well. 
I mean, I'm, I don't see the expert around here, <laughs> <laughs> but you can. Why don't Why don't you start, and I'll I'll chime in where 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 you think is appropriate. I think it might be. I think in order to do the whole story, maybe starting with the pregnancy episodes is a good place to start, and then we can move from that to the linkage. Do you want to speak through some of, some of the episodes and how that's created? And then Chris can support that because I know you've put a lot of time and effort into that as well. And then I can discuss the linkage and show some of the characterization results between the the linked uh, mothers and infants and the, you know, and then the, the whole group of mothers and infants that may or may not be linked. Yeah, we could do that. Um, so Chris, I do have slides that we could share. I, I know everybody hates slides, but I'm sorry, I'm probably just going to do it because I think it's a nice way to refer to what we're talking about. Um, so let me do that. Listen, just delete one element of the slide to make it more dynamic. And I think that'll satisfy that it's not really a static slideshow. So. <laughs> All right, can you can everyone see? Yes. Um, OK, perfect. Um, I'm going to put it in presenter mode too, which may preclude me from actually seeing you guys. Sorry about that. Um, and you're probably still not seeing presenter mode. Or are you? Nope, nothing's nope. changed yet. All right, well, we'll just soldier on with what we have then. Um, OK, so anyway, there is a a, um, a uh, publication out there in existence. This is the link to it. Uh, Chris is obviously an author on it, as is Patrick. Um, so they're your experts. There's more uh, discussion there, um, but basically um, the genesis, I guess, of the uh, um, pregnancy episode um, algorithm was um, that there are no direct measures of gestational age available in the databases, um, and it's something that we needed in-house in order to do studies. Um, so um, the outcomes for the pregnancy episode algorithm is um, we can look at live birth, stillbirth, abortions, and ectopic pregnancies. Um, they were able to develop um, the algorithm on several of our databases. We're going to get to those in a minute, just what those are. Um, and they did some validation. Um, so let's just move to that. I guess it's uh, if I could just say on the uh, we should qualify that to be spontaneous abortions, I guess, if that matters to anyone. Um, yep. Like we're not necessarily getting claims of of non spontaneous abortions like elective. Um, this is like miscarriage. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Um, so the, the three databases that it's um, developed on are CCA, Medicaid, and Optum, and then there's also CPRD. Um, this is really probably uh, the meat of the matter of where we start to get into the methods and the algorithm itself. Um, so, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you at this point. Sure. Um, real simple at a high level. I'll, I'll start at very simple and then broaden. At simply, we're just trying to establish a period of time where we establish the person seems to be pregnant. Um, a, a little bit deeper than that, we can say that we will use observational data to rule out possible misclassifications, such as if somebody records a stillbirth, um, but there's actually a live birth code too. We will favor the live birth over stillbirth over a miscarriage. Um, we will take other observational time to narrow the pregnancy, like something could be a preemie if it looks like there was a miscarriage prior to the ultimate um, pregnancy episode. So this algorithm takes all this different information and tries to uh, forge pregnancy episodes off of other coincidental information that surrounds these events. Go ahead, Claudia. Hi, how, I was wondering, how did you deal with um, twins um, and also um, I guess you were counting backwards from the birth we, we did a study we did a study where we were trying to look at if women were on a specific type of treatment and if that caused um, um, twins uh, malformation malformation, well, malformation sure right? um, mm -hmm. the algorithm the pregnancy algorithm isn't establishing the type of baby you had, just that the mother was pregnant. So I believe the answer to the question is, is if there was twins and that resulted in multiple live birth observational observations, we would pretty much just 
find the period of time that they were pregnant from when we thought they started their pregnancy to when the the live birth occurred. The second live birth after probably would have been discarded as too close to a previous confirmed live birth. So it's just a matter of um, we would just uh, to answer your question, we don't distinguish twins from from anything else. We're just looking for the pregnancy ended in what type okay. of outcome. And in fact, if there was like a live birth for one of them and maybe a stillbirth for the other, um, we would record that there was a live birth and the stillbirth probably would have been discarded as kind of being overridden by the fact that the live birth thing is the thing that we actually think that is more true. Twins is definitely an interesting case, but we didn't we didn't handle that there. And one, one more question for the CPRD study. Did you use the mother baby link that they've created or did you try to run this algorithm? Because I tried to use CPRD um, just before they had their mother baby link. Which we one did, did you use? We did use CPRD for pregnancy algorithms. Jamie Weaver will have to describe more of what the linkage was. That's why I said earlier. Okay. Like the pregnancy algorithm isn't about linkage, but I think um, Jamie is inferring some information about what that linkage could be based on pregnancy algorithms that were defined or identified. Yeah, for, for purposes of this, Claudia, we're only using the events observed in the mother to try to define the pregnancy episode. So we are not we are not inferring a pregnancy just based on the fact that they have had a mother child linkage available. OK, thank you. OK, so I'll just conclude with saying that um, there is a hierarchy involved about first we look for a live birth and establish that and then stillbirth and ectopic pregnancies, abortion, and then just simply um, there they recorded a delivery. We don't know anything about the nature of it, and so we will just kind of assume a default duration of pregnancy. Um, and uh, that hierarchy means like uh, stillbirths. You might find a lot of stillbirths in your observation with the patient record, but we may actually record no outcomes of uh, no pregnancy outcomes resulting in stillbirth because they may have been excluded by the fact that a live birth occurred. I hope that doesn't confuse anyone. I'm just trying to illustrate that the algorithm is not is, is a complex machine that does various logical um, decisions based on a hierarchy of priority of outcome. Any questions about like how? Uh, any 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 questions? I I think there's a lot in the paper, and I don't necessarily want to dive into it now if it's not helpful. But the paper does describe a lot of interesting approaches we took to basically um, limit like uh, like retries, for example. Like you can't be pregnant, you can't have two pregnancy episodes start within two weeks of each other because the thought is is that once you complete a pregnancy, your body needs a reset time, and then the pregnancy episode could only start say six weeks after a live birth, for example. Um, there was a there was a lot of um, a logic and thought put into that process with clinical input. So, Paul, I think you were the one that um, originally posed the question. Is this enough of an overview now to just sort of um, maybe move on to the idea of sort of like what's the impediment um, to maybe getting this instantiated in your environment? Or is there an impediment or just kind of start talking about how we get there? Or did oh, you this is perfect. To... And the okay. paper has a link to the phenotype library. That's really what I was looking for. OK, great. All right, well, then I'm going to stop sharing because I don't think slides are all that interesting, to be honest. Um, is it worth noting how we take the output and use it for our own CM? I, I guess I'll just call that out in case anybody's wondering. I have the I've run the algorithm. I get an output CSV file with a bunch of patient IDs and dates like what is that? Uh, what we do on our side is we um, take that output and we insert it into what well, we decided to put it into condition errors and we and we added like pregnancy standard concepts to indicate this is a pregnancy episode of a stillbirth or a pregnancy episode of a live birth. And so I think that's a very important missing piece. Um, I just want to make sure everybody understands like how do you use this information after it's done? And then once it's in the CDM, we can make use of it in like say cohort definitions and things like that. That is not a standard process, by the way. That's just what we do for our own environment. 
OK, I know Mui was also asking about um, sort of use cases for people in the community. If there was sort of common themes, I suspect that a lot of the use cases that may come up may be similar to what we are doing in house at Janssen. But if people want to talk about that, we can focus on that. Um, like I said, we could also move on to linkage if people are interested in sort of understanding more about the details of that. All right. Well, um, I guess since I'm not hearing an overwhelming direction in one way or another, why don't we talk about um, the use cases that people would have um, in the community? For which pregnancy episodes or mother child linkage? I think both. I think it'd be great to hear from people how they would envisage using these um, and sort of how, how we could support them in that. Well, I'll throw out an example. One, one of the things that we're looking at um, yep. for HDFN, um, hemolytic disease of the newborn fetus, we have, there are codes in the mother uh, for the um, isoimmunization event that happens in the mother from the uh, whatever whatever the blood differences between the um, the mother and the baby and then the but the mother is generally not affected by this it's the baby that's affected um, so we've been looking at um, looking at the mother and then the baby and to see whether you know what treatments the mother may have gotten during the um, during the pregnancy episode um, but uh, yeah, that's that's in its early stages. We only have the linkage. Well, I mean, I, I, right now I think we only have the linkage for one database. Uh, we're looking to get a second one up and running. I think that's going to be soon. I hope. What's what's sort of nice about the cohort method software is that in order to change to ba basically implement a study where the target and comparator cohorts are not the same people as in the outcome cohort where we would be looking at you know exposure during pregnancy but we want to see an outcome in later in time in a in a in the linked infant all you need to do is insert a few lines of code to put some to basically put the person id of the of the mothers in the target and comparator cohort into the um ID field of the outcome cohort and all of a sudden cohort method will just run run as it's supposed to. You just need to basically create a new outcome cohort table with new IDs in it. So it's not a huge it's not a huge lift to use the existing software to do these studies once we've got the linkage paper published. <laughs> right. I have a question about like sort of an inversion here. So a mother's pregnancy is almost the child's gestation. And it's probably you could consider that the same thing. Is there a thought of basically moving if you know that who the who the child was pregnant with? Is there a thought of moving like a gestation episode to the child so that you don't necessarily need to look at like who was the mother and do what you're describing? I think James, which is a, sort of like a not a trick, but sort of like an in injection of some mother data into the child data for purposes of doing a um, a, a cohort analysis. Like if if the gestation period was actually a period of time for the child itself, then maybe that would be a curious way of using these pregnancy episodes to use in an analysis. Like which are the children that we know that are gestating, for example, and what do they get during gestation? Yeah, what were, what were, what were they exposed to during gestation? This means that their observation period predates their birth a little bit because I know we only have birth year, but still like the observation period for a person now predates their birthday, which is fine. I'm just saying like it's an interesting. Um, there's there's a little bit of there's a little bit of um, like observation period slop around the end of the um, pregnancy episode just because there's sometimes the infant's observation period starts some period after the pregnancy episodes start and in some cases it starts before and i'm still not totally clear on what the if there's like some systematic um reason for that i think there's i think claire could speak a little more to it just because she's more familiar with the 
way that the insurance coverage works in the background and in these claims databases is just to note we've only done this in two um, U.S. administrative claims databases that have a lot of these like coverage period um, considerations that we need to really think through before we go executing these studies. Yeah, claims claims can be a little funny. I'm sure Mui is is familiar with this as well. But basically, like if a mother gives birth, um, the baby is immediately on her insurance. But then you have 30 days of open enrollment to get the baby on the actual insurance that they're going to be on. So there's often some kind of like movement and some kind of games you have to play with that to make sure that you're observation periods like we were actually looking at this the other day when linking mothers and children um, and if you limited on the child's observation period we were actually like dropping a lot of them and we had to add 30 days because of that 30-day window um, so it, it would be interesting and and it, it, we'd have to figure out how we would how we would work that observation period in the way you're talking Chris because right now we do drop people who have an observations period start before their birth date that's just a rule that we personally employ um but i think it would be interesting to try to um figure out how we could identify these children and maybe it's a cohort you know cohort date window but even then the cohort start and ends are usually determined one of them is usually determined by an observation period so oh, absolutely yeah yeah uh, uh just to dovetail on what you're saying i think that it would make sense to my mind to basically bring in everybody by default based on their enrollment so that means the babies start later once they get enrolled on their insurance thing but then as a post-processing step um leverage these pregnancy episodes to extend observation periods of children in a way that their gestation period makes sense you know so then you because i guess we could argue that if if they're being seen if the mother is being seen for for issues with the child they they are at risk of receiving diagnosis codes attributed to the child so maybe you could say if they're under if they're during pregnancy they're probably under observation just same as their mom is so you just extend the child's observation back. To the beginning yeah, of the but you'd also have to uh, take all those all those events that happen to the mother that's attributed to the mother's person ID mm -hmm. at that time period. And you'd also have to attribute them to the child because um, otherwise you won't find any events for that person, even if you extend the observation period back. Yeah, I wasn't um, I don't know. You would know much better. Do they distinguish parent uh, like mother mother diagnosis codes like fatigue? to the child, which might be like erratic heartbeat, like is, or they like, you just recorded always, an erratic heartbeat, and you don't a, know who it is. If it's a pregnant woman, it's always going to be on the mother, even if it's like fetal heart rate low or something. Um, and I'm, you know, physicians, please speak up, speak up as well. Um, but until that baby is born, it's essentially part of the mother and the mother gets that fetal code. Okay. So we like so what what would be difficult is to try to tease out events that happen to the mother that would need to be applied to the baby. Yeah. However, if we're just talking drug exposure and we're saying like what was the baby exposed to, I think that would be pretty straightforward to say like just move all those drug exposures to the baby's account um or the baby's like um yeah their record and then even if it doesn't cross the placenta you it, i think it'd just be easy to just like move all of them over and then you could see like what was the baby exposed to in utero and what were their outcomes yeah one. I'm it's now tough, leaning yeah. towards like just allowing you to talk in terms of what happened to the mom during the pregnancy and as an yeah. effect on the child. I was, yeah. Uh, yeah, it comes up. It comes to the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, and right now the way we identify mothers and children is through fact relationship, which is not even an option to create a cohort. Like I know Patrick's saying he wants to create a um, algorithm using Atlas, but we can't even really create a cohort correct me if I'm wrong, because we cannot use fact relationship to build a cohort. Yeah, so we Erica, couldn't. Yeah, Erica and I have.
put in a, a request to make to add that to the uh, the cohort definition UI so we could yeah. so we could do something like that. I don't know if that how far that down the pipeline that is, but that would be a pretty quick option to be able to do that. Well, and well, so one of the things we've been talking about in the CDM working group is that like, is it is a fact relationship table still a viable table? Because we don't really I like not that many people use it. I know Don Torak has talked about a, like basically associating like a systolic blood pressure and a diastolic blood, blood pressure. They're taken at the same time. I think Paul, you do that. Um, but that's the only real use case besides mother child linkage that we found for fact relationship. And so we've been discussing. Oh, go ahead, Paul. Oh, I, we have a. We want to do concordance with path and radiology results with the fact relationship as well. Mm -hmm. But there's also like those keys we've put in the uh, event tables that would allow you to do that without going through fact relationship too. So we're trying to just determine in the CDM working group is fact relationship still a viable table. And if not, what would be our next solution for associating mothers and children? Um, and we don't have a good answer for that now because, but we know that like fact relationship is not like a great answer for mothers and children. We just don't have a better one. Um, so if you, do you want me to give you the perspective from the tool builder perspective yes, of what yes, limits please. this? Um, so adding, functionality to Cersei and cohort definitions using fact relationship would not be a big deal. The only reason why it's always been like a pushback for me or you get the sense of some resistance to doing it is because just implementing functions to leverage fact relationship data is not necessarily a solution to a problem. It might actually be a function that no one can use because Fact relationships are by definition abstract. You can represent mother child linkages. You could represent procedure, procedure and outcome. You know, this this out this condition was related to a procedure. Put that in fact relationship. Everybody had an infinite number of ideas to deal with in fact relationship, making it very difficult for me to come down to how do I make this a consumable function? However, that being said, if we wanted to say we want to describe information in cohorts related to linking to the mother, then like that's how I would present some type of criteria attribute in cohort definitions about mother linkage. Under the covers, we use fact relationship to resolve how to how to make that statement about the observational data, but no one has to actually mess with fact relationship to get that answer. So basically what means is, is that you, Claire, as part of the CDM working group person would say, this is how we're representing mother child linkages. The implementation is done through fact relationship. I get that information and say, great. If somebody wants to ask a question about parent child linkage, I will say linked to other person or something like I, I think about how to represent questions about what you want answered about identifying parent child linkages in the data. And that's the that's the interface quote, quote unquote that I give to users to use, and all that gets resolved under to fact relationships in some ugly, disgusting way that no one will understand if they looked at the raw query. But all they need to know is that in this context, I'm looking for parent child linkages. In another case, I think Paul, you brought up a one with concordance or something where that is another concept that you can describe that I can get a functional requirement around. And when I implement that, it's just another use of fact relationship that nobody needs to necessarily see. So the reason why you don't see fact relationship exposed in any of the tools, just to summarize, is that the concept around it is too vague and, and nebulous that it would be very hard for me to instruct anybody on how to use that function uh, and even present a UI that makes it accessible. But if we instead talked in terms of specific use cases for fact relationship that you wanted to encapsulate into some operation, then we can talk and I can actually make something that's functional. So that is the reason why you might not be seeing certain things happen in uh, and same thing with the episode table, another conversation. But I'm just saying there's sometimes it's hard to manifest a usable feature to a user when it's not clear exactly what the what the context of it is. And by definition, you want these things to be so open ended that anybody can use it. It works against me trying to make a function that actually addresses a problem. So so uh, can that. I ask a question? This is Claudia again. So is what you're saying that um, a person could study um, pairs? So if I wanted to study a mother and a child, with factors X, whether it's treatment or exposure to something else or seasonality or whatever, um, I would be able to study them in pairs. 
Yes. Um, it depends. How do you mean to study it? Like using our standard tools or just using CDM data in general? Well, and you could I, write I, your I'm, own code. I'm, I was thinking about what you were saying now and being able to to sort of group them together in some ways. And I'm thinking about the also the data that's available in Europe compared to what you're talking about, I think, using claims data sources. Um, they're, they're a bit different. And so yeah. would that include both types of data sources and just some type of algorithm that would help a researcher, an epidemiologist coming in to look at a mother and her children, not somebody else's children, but her children. And that's what I mean in pairs. Yeah, so, um, so as long as we have a common idea of that we're talking about a linkage, the, the source mm -hmm. of the data just has the work of trying to represent it in the common data model to mm -hmm. represent the pair. And then we have to support functions in our tools to talk in terms of pairs. I would say exactly. either you want to think of, you want to either focus on the child linked to a parent or focus on the parent linked to the child. But one way or the other, like I don't, whenever I think of modeling and prediction and things like that, it's, not necessarily you're predicting for a pair. You're usually predicting for a specific entity, the patient. Yeah, it's so either I, malformation to the child or exposure of a drug for the mother. Right. But then somehow you need to put those two pieces together. Yeah, I'm not sure that's where I'm out of my depth on that one about how to talk in terms of pairs. Everything I've felt that we've been studying up to this point revolved around a specific subject in question. And we could say the subject in question is the child with this type of parent, or we could reverse that and yeah. say it's the parent with yeah. this type of child. Yes. We don't know how to say together, this is the outcome for these yeah. things together, other than to say I, you're still talking about one or the other with the other. <laughs> I, I, which, you, which you could be, but when you're doing a study, you want to make sure that you have the right mother with the right child and sure. the right exposures over, over a period of time. Yes. You, you could, for example, you could condition some sort of like if you were studying outcomes you could condition your outcome regression model on matched mothers and child similarly to how you condition those on like you know patients matched by propensity score for example so there's there's definitely a way to do it and you would it would just require that link id between two people that is what i'm talking about um, and that's where cprd has progressed in this past few years to get that linkage um, created. And I guess I'm wondering if you guys are working towards something like that. Um, I, I work at AstraZeneca, I'm an epidemiologist, so I'm not so nitty gritty into the data like you guys are, um, but I love this conversation. Thank you. We are very so, much working towards that as well. Okay. So, so Claudia, you, you're saying you're in CPRD, you're, you actually have the linkage? between mother and child? Yeah, so a few years ago, I did a study where we were trying to build a, a mother-child link, uh, and it was really, really hard. And then in the meantime, uh, prior to that piece of work being completed, they finalized their mother-baby link. Uh, and so if you want to study, this is what I mean by pairs, a, a mother and her mm -hmm. child, and let's say exposure, that that's, there's a way of, of having that linked for you. And I'm wondering, I think someone here in the presentation, they said something about CPRD data being included. And I was wondering, uh, th this is what I'm trying to bridge the gap in my mind um, to understand what data you're actually using. Is it just claims US data or is it data from CPRD? And is it the linked data with the mother and child in CPRD? Or is it some type of algorithm or, or system that that you've been talking about, Chris? Yeah, I think it's a bit uh, we're talking about two different things. So your, yeah. your question about linkage, Jamie and others have developed a, a mother infant linkage in Optum and in CCAE, and that soon will be published and um, will be available for people to review. As far as the pregnancy algorithm is concerned, that has been developed in um, CCAE, Medicaid, Optum, and in CPRD. Mm -hmm. And the linkage is dependent on the pregnancy algorithm. So mm -hmm. that sort of gives the sphere the of what's yeah. the data. The, sort link, of the linkage on. requires on the pregnancy episodes algorithm insofar as the pregnancy episodes algorithm identifies 
mothers with, you know, I mean, the pregnancy episode algorithm has multiple pregnancy outcomes, but it uses those with live birth outcomes as a starting point. And then because we're, we've done this linkage algorithm only in two U.S. administrative claims databases, there there's this thing called like a family ID, which is basically an insurance um, coverage ID that multiple people can be on. So there's basically like one primary, you know, insurance plan holder and their dependents. So you can kind of see who is all on the same plan. And then we use some various, you know, SQL tricks to try to zero in on who could be a mother and who could be that that mother's infant. Yeah. Yeah, live births. We also use that as well. It was, this was a, a while back because anything else would be very difficult. OK, thank you. Thank you. But it's but it's this insurance code that is that we leverage in the algorithm in these insurance claims databases. And like, I don't know what's happening at CPRD, like someone at CPRD is doing something similar to create their linkage. Just, I don't know what it is. Somebody do, you have, do you have to ask that specifically, Claudia, or does it? Come native with your database. Um, no, I'm sorry, my dog is here. Mm -hmm. um, it, no, this was this was um, just a research piece that I did a few years ago. I was just curious to see how it was yeah. developing. Yeah, Joel, it's kind of like the hospital data where you have to request the yeah. linked data. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. In CPRD, yeah, you have to do an ISAC protocol, get approval, and then specify what linkage you actually want. If you want hospital data, mother, child information, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Uh, I'll put the documentation for it in the chat. Claudia, was that study published anywhere that you did, or was that just for internal consumption? It was for internal consumption. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, just looking to see what you could share. Great. All right. Well, I think um, this has been a pretty productive conversation. I feel like getting people sort of clear on what it is and what it isn't. And I know it's a little bit lots of details and whatnot. So um, unfortunately, I think Mui is not here, so I don't know if there are other things she had in mind to discuss. Um, oh, I'm back. Oh, you are back. Nope. Excellent. I had nothing more. No, again, we were just wanting folks to get out there and asking, start asking about uh, you know, mother baby linkage and what some of the challenges were. So, and I think we accomplished that today. In the hopefully not too distant future, we will have our paper submitted for, you know, for, for general consumption and we could find some time to present to anybody in the Odyssey community that's interested, you know, some of the nitty gritty or details about how the linkage was created and then how we evaluated the generalizability of the linked mothers and babies to those that aren't in the sort of larger population. And we've got some kind of nice interactive dashboards that you can sort of um, navigate around to look at how well the characteristics correspond of these linked and all mothers and infants for whatever you know characteristic you might be interested in. So we, Jill and I, and Claire, sorry, I'm voluntelling you guys. Jill and Claire and I could could um, find some time to present this to anyone interested. Well, I would um, in the Asia Pacific community. We would love, once you guys, like you said, uh, published and available, we would love for you guys to speak at the Asia Pacific uh, community about what you guys have done. Because I think it helps showcase, you know, innovative work that's above and beyond what we normally do within Odyssey, right? Yeah, but I, I, we haven't really talked about it much on this call, but another thing that we've been working on internally is developing some um, different phenotypes for pregnancy related outcomes and things beyond what has been discussed on this call. So I would say that there are things being developed and if they're of interest to others, it might be helpful to know that because um, it would be something that we could share um, so if there is some specific pregnancy related outcome that isn't covered in the um, the uh, pregnancy algorithm um, manuscript that um, Chris referred to earlier, um, just let us know because we will be we are working on some of those now. Thank you for the conversation. It's been really awesome. Um, 
uh, Claudia, your comment about being able to create a cohort that actually brings in both people as a link or as like together. Like, I want to bring groups of people together is something I hadn't really considered thinking about. So I'm glad you brought it to my attention. Something I can maybe think about for future functionality. So yeah, I appreciate it. it. Was, it was tricky. I had a, I tried to publish it, but it, it just it didn't have fancy results. Um, so I still have it on my desktop. Um, <laughs> But I think I have a poster. Maybe I'll I'll put it up here if I find it. Okay. Sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Have All a right. good one, everyone. All right. Bye.